Dear guests, dear colleagues, dear students, dear Director General Irina Bokova, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome you at the Kosko University of Venice and to open this important ceremony aimed at awarding the Honorary Fellowship to the Director General of UNESCO. The Honorary Fellowship of Kaposka University of Venice is awarded to distinguished individuals in recognition of their exceptional scholarly or intellectual achievement and special contribution in academic fields or in public life. It might also be comforting someone whose relationship with Kaposka has been of tremendous value strengthening both the prestige and the visibility of our institution. To our university, it is extremely significant award, which was established in 2010 with the first fellowship, which was conferred on Zhou Hamin, outstanding leader of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference of the Shanghai Committee and professor of international law. Ten further fellowships have been then conferred on distinguished individuals, such as the director Nikita Sergevich Mikhalkov, the actress uh, Ottavia Piccolo, and the Korean poet Ko Un. Today, Kafoskovi is extremely delighted to award the fellowship to Irina Bokova, whom I wish to thank for her commitment to fostering the cultures of the world, promoting the dialogue among peoples championing gender equality and advocating for European integration. Without taking up too much of your time, I would like to thank, warmly thank Vina Bokova, who finally has honored us today with her presence, and I give the floor to our professor, Luigi Tarka, professor of philosophy in our university and director of the Center for Human Rights. Professor Tanka will deliver his laudatio in honor of Irina Bokova. Thank you very much. <coughs> Honorable Vice Rector, dear Director General Irina Bokova, distinguished colleagues and participants. I am honored to have been invited by the director as director of the Center for Human Rights in Kaposvili to eulogize the work that Dr. Irina Bokova has done over the years, in particular since 2009, when she was appointed as director general of the UNESCO the United Nations Education Scientific Cultural Organization. She is the first woman and the first Eastern European to lead the organization. Her curriculum is astonishing. Born in Sofia, Bulgaria, she graduated from Moscow State Institute of International Relations and studied at the University of Maryland, Washington, and the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Irina Bokova then joined the United Nations Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bulgaria in 1977. Irina Bokova was Minister for Foreign Affairs, Coordinator of Bulgaria-European Union Relations, and Ambassador of Bulgaria to France, Monaco, and UNESCO, and personal representative of the President of the Republic of Bulgaria to the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, OIF. As Secretary of the Council of Ministers for European Integration and as Foreign Minister, Irina Bokova has always advocated for European integration. Bokova has been the Director General of UNESCO since the 15th of November 2009, and was successfully re-elected for a second term in 2013. As Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bokova is actively engaged in international efforts to advance gender equality, quality education for all, and combat terrorist financing by preventing the illicit traffic of cultural goods. 
She is a leading advocate for ensuring quality education for all and has championed gender equality, making this her own personal priority for the organization. Other fields of action include enabling scientific cooperation for sustainable development, such as early warning systems for tsunamis or transboundary water management agreements and global advocacy for the safety for journalists and freedom of expression. Of expression. I quote, at the International Day of Peace last year, she posited, I quote, this must be our starting point, the individual rights and dignity of every woman and man. The UNESCO Constitution states that the defenses of peace must be built in the minds of women and men through education, through freedom of expression, through intercultural dialogue, through respect for human rights and cultural diversity, through scientific cooperation. Drafted in 1945, after a terrible and devastating war, this message has never been so vital in societies that are transforming and are ever more diverse." End of quote. These are difficult times where conflicts, natural emergencies, human suffering, huge violations of human rights occur. Violations that shake us as scholars of different disciplines. In the spirit of interdisciplinarity that characterizes our Center for Human Rights, we discuss a lot on the challenges that the world faces today. The prohibition of torture and of genocide the protection of cultural heritage, gender equality, refugees' rights. We have wondered about the existence of a right to philosophy, how to react as an academic to contribute to building the foundations for a better world. I found in the declaration and statements by Irina Bokova several interesting aspects that I would like to mention. Around some pillars, some priorities, she has indeed constructed her vision of UNESCO for a new world. In her 2013 mission statement, she has mentioned three priorities. She said that the first priority is human dignity, which is inextricably linked to human development and to poverty alleviation. A sustainable human development is at the core of the Agenda 2030, elaborated by the United Nations. Bokova has stressed that sustainability means quality of education and culture, which she defined as our strongest social cement. Let me mention here a strong affirmation after the destruction of cultural heritage in Syria. I quote, the systematic destruction of cultural symbols embodying Syrian cultural diversity reveals the true intent of such attacks, which is to deprive the Syrian people of its knowledge and history." End of quote. With regard to culture, she has also defended the cultural heritage of religious minorities. Last September, she posited, heritage means everything to minorities. Fundamentally, it belongs to all of us. This is not about protecting stones. This is about defending people, identities. This is about defending human rights and the humanity we all share." End of quote. Here, you can understand the importance of the link between the protection of, the protection of cultural heritage and human rights her second priority is equality, which is both an institutional and a personal priority. She considers the empowerment of girls and women as the new frontier for human rights in the 20th century. Empowerment means school, quality education, and access to culture and information. Eradicating gender inequalities is an instrument to eradicate violence against women to promote dialogue and to recognize the role of women in the protections in the protection of cultural heritage. Her third priority is learning to live together. I quote her view from the mission statement. 
the borders of peace are shifting within societies in the perceptions that every person holds of their own culture and those of others. Making peace with others implies being at peace with ourselves, with multiple affiliations and with painful memories that demand our respect." End of quote. These are only few examples of her work to endorse the values of dialogue, diversity, human dignity, and human rights. This fellowship is a way to recognize her commitment as expert and as woman at the international level, a way to acknowledge the importance of international experts that work independently with passion and courage to face multiple challenges. Her work will be of inspiration for many of our students who are willing to take the challenge and contribute to the promotion of human dignity and peace in their country and worldwide. We are honored to have you here, Dr. Bokova, and to have the unique possibility to listen to your Lectio Magistralis on fostering cultural diversity as a shared heritage to build peace. I will now give the floor to the Honorable Vice Rector to award the fellowship to Irina Bokova. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Luigi Tarka. And now I read the motivation for the awarding of the fellowship. On behalf of Professor Michele Bugliesi, Rector of Caposco University of Venice, with regard to the Academic Senate Resolution of October 2012, conferring honorary membership of the faculty of Kafosco University of Venice on the General, Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bokova, in recognition of the important contribution to promotion of peace and sustainable development through the ground of cultural education and sciences, her vision for UNESCO in a globalized world a new humanist for the 21st century that seeks to ensure that UNESCO will meet the new global challenges, her role as advocate of freedom of expression, free circulation of ideas, and free exchange of knowledge, her support, legal support of the importance of culture for the growth of the nations, and her contribution to the pursuit of the international established millennium development goals we hereby confer upon the Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bokova, whom I invite to come here, the honorary membership of the faculty of Kaposkri University of Venice. University, uh, dear Professor Tarka, uh, Prefetto uh, Kutaina, uh, dear friends, uh, I'm deeply moved and honored to be here with you today in the beautiful Kafuskari University. And of course, I'm deeply moved by this honor that has been bestowed to me, which I take is an honor bestowed to UNESCO. This wonderful organization that defends human dignity, as Professor Tark just mentioned, who gives the opportunity for intercultural dialogue and 
for everything that is needed today for young people, of sharing knowledge, of fostering creativity, and I would say imagination. And the message I want to share with you today is of support and solidarity with Italy. Allow me once again to say how devastated we were with the three violent earthquakes, and I heard this morning also there was another one that struck at the heart of the country, along with the message on the role of heritage, of cultural diversity, building peace, and fostering developments. And I'm deeply honored to be in this prestigious university, because universities have always played a special role in advancing the free flow of ideas, of intercultural dialogue, and of human knowledge. And I would say UNESCO chairs in Italy and throughout the world are privileged partners in this endeavor. This is why I have always been determined to reach out to students, professors, academia, university, schools, to foster the spirit of dialogue and openness, to respond to the rise of new forms of intolerance and hatred we see in this world today. Among all prestigious Venetian institutions, your university is also a very special place, as it was the first institute of higher education in commerce established in Italy. It bears witness to a long-standing Venetian tradition of knowledge, of, of uh, linking commerce and culture, of business and the arts, guided by the strong conviction business is not only about sharing goods, but about sharing ideas and knowledge. This has been a feature of Venice throughout history, and I believe this carries important lessons for today on the need to harness the power of cultural diversity to foster dialogue and sustainable growth, to foster tolerance in economic activity at the same time. And as I was also privileged to visit a beautiful exhibition, a wonderful exhibition of an incredible talented Chinese painter and sculptor, the UNESCO artist for peace, Mr. Jaime Lin, I would like to recognize and to thank him for his presence here today with all of us. Thank you, Mr. Jaime Lin. This is a big honor for me. The city of Venice and its lagoon Ladies and gentlemen, as you know very well, is a World Heritage Site. I would say one of the jewels on this incredibly important list. Everybody knows World Heritage and most people believe sites are inscribed on the list because they are beautiful and impressive only. And of course, this is partly true. But as a deeper level, these sites are on the list because they embody what we call outstanding universal value, because they tell us something about who we are as a single community, about the values and principles we stand for. Venice grew because it developed trade across the Mediterranean and beyond, including with the Muslim world, and gave birth to unprecedented cultural and intellectual exchanges from the 9th to the 18th century at the western end of the Silk Road, all the way to China. Venetian glassmakers became the brightest in Europe, drawing on the techniques of Egyptian and Syrian artisans, integrating their own genus, and then teaching craftsmen of the Ottoman Empire. The art of the portrait was introduced in Istanbul by Gentile Bellini, who was a Venetian master sent by the Dutch to paint the Sultan Mehmed II, who conquered Constantinople in 1453. These intercultural exchanges transformed Venice into a meeting point between East and West, bringing together people from all backgrounds, as we see in many paintings by Carpaccio of Bellini. I like to believe this interest for diversity was in fact an effective method for innovation, and this was sustained by the publishing industry and the flow of knowledge and ideas. All Europe 
knows the great legacy of the Italian humanist Aldous Manichius, Prince of the Press, who invented the Italian type and the paperback pocket editions <coughs> all put on today. He spread the humanist spirit across the continent, publishing Aristotle, Aristophan, Sophocle, Herodotus, bequeathing Greek literature as an individual heritage of humanity. This shows the profound link between cultural diversity and freedom of expression, and how much intercultural exchanges can foster innovation and renewal. Venice is an example of what can be achieved when all institutions of public policy, publishing, trade, and the arts are headed in the same direction to bring together the best talents, artists, engineers, and ideas from across the globe. When you think of uh, Tiziano, Tintoretto, Veronese, and see how much their creative rivalry and mutual influence shaped their works, you understand their genus originates not only in their individual talent, but also in the environment of the city itself. This, I believe, is the spirit of Venice. But it is also the modernity of Venice. And this is the spirit we need today more than ever. We need to renew our trust in the power of diversity to make us stronger, more innovative and creative, to foster dialogue, but also to create jobs at the same time. This is an important message when we see violent extremists targeting human lives and attacking cultural diversity. This is an important message when we hear voices seeking to divide communities, manipulating culture to fuel xenophobia. In too many countries around the world, we see the rise of doctrines based on withdrawal and rejection. We see deep displacement and migration crisis, the tragic situation of refugees and armed conflicts exploited to whip up hatred of the other, to stigmatize minorities. We hear the stereotyping of religions and cultures, pretending different peoples cannot live together, and that the world would be a better place if we return to the golden age when pure cultures lived in peace, protected from outside influence in a past that never existed. What is at stake today in Venice when I speak the history about this incredible city is much more than celebrating beautiful palazzios and glorious names of the history of art. This is about reaffirming very specific human values and rights. This is about renewing with a positive vision of humanity. The history of Venice, I believe, holds the keys to the cultural literacy. It teaches us how it works and how we can bring it back. It calls for mobilizing heritage as a force for creativity, innovation, and sustainable development. This was at the heart of UNESCO's contribution to the United Nations Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. It stands at the core of UNESCO's 2005 convention, convention for the promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions, and of course the 1972 Convention for the Protection of World Heritage. The same idea underpins the UNESCO 2001 Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, recognizing that respect for cultural diversity cannot be delinked from respect for human rights. The same declaration states that cultural diversity is an important for humanity as is, is important to humanity as biodiversity is for nature. There is nowadays rising global awareness on the need to protect biodiversity and the Paris Climate Agreement is a telling example. But we need similar commitment to cultural diversity in the world. And this means developing much stronger tools and concepts to equip young people 
with capacities to deal with cultural diversity. We must not tire in repeating the extent to which cultures are enriched by mutual exchange. We must remember historic facts and recall how peoples and identities have always mingled, shaping richer, more complex cultures with multiple identities. We must show no culture has ever prospered in isolation, that diversity is a strength and not a weakness. We must say tolerance is not naive or passive relativism. It is a fight for the respect of fundamental rights. UNESCO's World Heritage embodies this very revolutionary idea, which is a profound humanistic idea at the same time, that people of all cultures and faith can unite around outstanding universal values. When a World Heritage site is destroyed anywhere in the world, we all suffer, we are all diminished, even if it is from another religion, another period, another culture, another period. This helps us realize we all belong to the same family. And it is precisely this idea violent extremists seek to destroy, because they know the power of culture to bring people together. World Heritage Sites tell us there is no pure culture in the streets of hundreds of World Heritage Sites. From the Silk Roads to the Kapaknyan, people see how cultures are intertwined. And the city of Venice is one of them. And in the face of this reality, we have a choice to make. We can try to ignore these interactions distort our heritage in endless disputes about what belongs to whom. Or we can make another choice. We can decide to unite for heritage, to harness the power of heritage to build peace and to strengthen the feeling of our shared humanity. This is the spirit of the campaign Unite for Heritage I launched at the University of Baghdad in Iraq with young students. But this does not come by itself. It needs to be taught in schools and in the media. It needs to be shared with young people. I remember when I went to Tunisia just after the revolution in 2011 to celebrate the World Press Freedom Day and ensure freedom of expression would be embedded in the new Tunisian constitution. And I visited one school after a visit to the Bordeaux Museum, the same museum that was later attacked by extremists. And this, those of you who know it, is a museum with extraordinary Roman mosaics. And you will excuse me for saying this on an Italian soil, but the Bordeaux Museum holds some of the most beautiful Roman mosaics in the world. And these young boys and girls who were in sixth or seventh grade, and I was telling them that they have to be proud of their heritage. And I mentioned the museum, and they have to be proud also of the museum with such a rich Roman, Phoenician, Islamic layers of cultures. And one girl raised her hand and said something which I will never forget. She said, why should I be proud of heritage that does not belong to me, that uh, belongs to another culture. It does not belong to my religion. It belongs to the Italians. Why should I care about preserving this heritage? And for the first time, I thought that we really need to teach young people that culture, there is no pure culture, and all this culture permeate with each other. And I told her, that maybe her great-grandfather made some of these mosaics. And I told her that these influences, their different players, are the way we understand the world, that we understand our common humanity, and that this is the way we have to interact with our neighbors and to live today in peace. And I came away from this visit with a very deep conviction that we need to strengthen 
the historic references and, his and intellectual tools we give to young people to help them deal with diversity. And here today, in front of you, I'm confident we can do so. So, ladies and gentlemen, home to exceptional cultural heritage, Italy has chosen to stand at the forefront of global heritage protection efforts, developing knowledge and best practices in restoration, safeguarding, education, and the fight against illicit trafficking of cultural property. It is thanks to the determination of Italy's representatives to UNESCO that several important decisions were adopted at the initiative of the permanent delegate of Italy, Ambassador de Monaco, including, most significantly, a new strategy to reinforce our action to protect cultural heritage during armed conflict. And I wish also to pay tribute once again to the permanent delegation of Italy for taking a special initiative and chairing a group of friends, Unite for Heritage at UNESCO, bringing member states together on this so important issue. The establishment by Italy of a task force of cultural heritage experts and members of the Italian Carabinieri inscribes itself perfectly in this strategy. And my thanks go to the four ministers, particularly to Minister Gentiloni, but also to ministers of education, of defense and culture, because this is precisely upon their initiative that we launch this important initiative on the Global Coalition Unite for Heritage, which I was honored, for which I was honored to sign an agreement earlier this year in February with Minister Gentiloni. So, nowadays, many more countries are coming on board. We are exploring all possible ways to strengthen the linkages between peace-building operations on behalf of the United Nations humanitarian emergency responses. And this is also the spirit of the agreement I signed earlier this year with the International Committee for the Red Cross. The same idea underpins the landmark resolution 2199 of the United Nations Security Council on the financing of terrorism, which bans trade in cultural goods illicitly trafficked from Syria. We have created a wide platform working with all key partners like ICOMOS, ECROM, World Customs Organization, the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, Interpol, UNIDRA, and others. We have launched new training programs for judges and prosecutors, and we support also the work of the International Criminal Court to end impunity for the destruction of heritage as war crimes, as we have seen most recently in the Timbuktu case. We are working with customs authorities and such central partners in the European Union to harmonize import controls. UNESCO is also support, supporting the training of armed forces and more and more peacekeeping troops are undergoing specific training. This was the case, the case with the blue helmets in Mali and this is the case also with the French military. But let me emphasize the particular role of the Italian Carabinieri, which have always made a stellar contribution in this endeavor. And I believe we can do even more to train soldiers, for instance, with the Francesco Morosini Naval Military School here in Venice. We do all this, ladies and gentlemen, with the Italian forces because we know the protection of heritage is not only about saving old stones and bricks, it is about values. Violent extremists are targeting all symbols in institutions about creativity and free thinking. Monuments are bombed, schools are destroyed, universities are attacked, journalists are beheaded. I think extremists destroy heritage because they are afraid of history. They are afraid of the narrative it incarnates. Heritage delegitimizes them because it embodies a message of dialogue and tolerance they abhor. 
Palmyra, like Venice, was a city of merchants and intercultural exchanges, a crossroads of caravans sharing goods and ideas from Europe, Asia, on the Silk Road. The disappearance of such sites affects people in their core identity and their resilience. It accelerates the disintegration of societies. All this is why the destruction of heritage is simply inseparable from the persecution of people and consequently from the humanitarian response we have to take. In January, UNESCO confirmed the destruction of the monastery of Birmar Elia in Mosul, the oldest Christian monastery in Iraq. Following this destruction, Father Paul Tabit Habib from Erbil said, we see this as an attempt to expel us from Iraq. We know Iraq's Christian population has dropped from 1.3 million in 2000 to 300,000 today. But violent extremists target not only Christians, but also Muslims, Yazidis, Shabaks, Turkmens, anybody that is different from them. Violent extremists do not choose between culture and people, they attack both, as part of a strategy which I called cultural cleansing. In response, we must consider the protection of cultural heritage as a humanitarian and security imperative. When the fabric of human society is under attack from forces that deny the existence of shared heritage, we need to hold out a different and positive vision and a sense of kinship with one another as part of a single global community. This is the new frontier of the battle for ideas. This is a global struggle for the hearts and minds, a battle we cannot win with hard power only. And this is the core mandate of UNESCO, bringing together education, culture, the sciences, information and communication to help people engage in dialogue with one another. Heritage has special power to bring people together. And once again, the history of Venice is a telling example. 50 years ago, historical devastating floods struck Venice. A few weeks later, on 2nd December 1966, UNESCO Director General at the time, Mr. René Mayor, launched an appeal that led to the international campaign for the safeguarding of Venice. This outstanding cooperation experience amounted to hundreds of millions of dollars and allowed the restoration monuments of major monuments within the city and most importantly, it allowed the inventoring of Venetian heritage in close cooperation with the Ministry of Culture Heritage, the municipality, the patriarchate and some 50 private committees throughout the world. The joint UNESCO International Private Committees established some 700 restoration and conservation projects, as well as research and capacity building activities. A few years later, as a result of the Venice Report, published by UNESCO in 1969, the attention of the world was called again on Venice to extend the safeguarding efforts to the entire lagoon. This led to the adoption of 1973 of the Special Law for Venice. As a result of an international roundtable promoted by UNESCO, the Venice Lagoon System project was launched, providing considerable knowledge for the management of the city. This is UNESCO's contribution to Venice, which also hosts the UNESCO Regional Bureau for Science and Culture in Europe. This is leverage, and this is directly beneficial to all Venetians. Today, UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee continue to work in full transparency, neutrality, and commitment to support the government of Italy in its efforts to safeguard Venice. This is not, my dear friend, to lecture Venice 
or to give lessons. This is not to preach heritage in the past, as we hear sometimes. Some people say that UNESCO is anti-business or wishes to stop the development of Venice. And I believe nothing is further from the truth. For more than 20 years, UNESCO has been, been making the case for the link between culture and development, fostering creative industries, fostering sustainable tourism as a driver for inclusive growth and green jobs. Together with Minister Dario Franceschini at the World Culture Forum in Florence in 2014, we showcased the power of culture as a strategic economic driver, representing some 30 million jobs worldwide and up to 10% of national GDPs on average. We published the World Creative Economy Report with UNDP in 2013 and the landmark report Reshaping Cultural Policies last year to help member states make the most of creative industries. In fact, creative industries are one of the fastest growing sectors of the world economy. World trade in creative goods and services totaled a record of 600 billion just a few years ago, more than doubling between 2002 and 2011. And this is why between 2009 and 2012, UNESCO supported the municipality of Venice in coordinating the large consultation process to elaborate a sustainable management plan. This included a workshop in this very university in Kafoskari on culture and development in Venice, from restoration to revitalization. And this is why, one of the other reasons, is that I wanted to be with you here today. A new creative economy is emerging and we believe Venice has a unique role to play in it, as well as Italy, as a cultural superpower. Venice hosts living traditions, intangible heritage and know-how, from glass making to the gondolas, from silk to the carnival and tourism. This is about identity, but this is also about jobs. The Biennale of Venice and the Film Festival attract hundreds of thousands of visitors and artists from across the globe, notably from the Global South, showcasing their creative creativity and modernity. We can promote these activities in a balanced cultural ecosystem, and this calls for more training, more skills, more long-term investments to protect the cultural capital of the city. UNESCO is determined to stand by the people of Venice and to support their talent, their passion, their creativity. This is also the spirit of our landmark recent publication on culture, urban future, which was prepared with many partners, including the University of Venice, UNESCO Chair on Urban Policies. We, I believe, are all in this together. And the role of UNESCO is to help to accompany with its own tools and mandate to provide scientific advice, to convene partners, to raise awareness. And if we do this, we do it, do it, because we simply love Venice and we care about Venice. I believe that in doing so, we can foster both development and peace, sustain the economy, protect culture and heritage, and nurture dialogue. All these go hand in hand. And this is the history of Venice I have tried to highlight. And I wish to thank you once again for this opportunity to convey this message of support and admiration for your city. And to this university, my deep gratitude for the exceptional honor I was bestowed with. Thank you.
very much. And I wish to thank also Hameli, who is also a honorary fellow, and Ambassador Vatani, who is with us today. Thank you.